You're watching Invisible Empire, a new world order defined. I'm Alex Jones, the producer of this film. I have produced five of the top ten films in internet history, whether it's Loose Change Final Cut, Endgame, The Obama Deception, or Fall of the Republic. Yes, we've made informative, well-documented films, but the real credit for the success of these documentaries lies with you, the viewers. My friends, Invisible Empire is so important for people that need a crash course in the history of the ruling class and what this establishment is setting up. Please support the filmmakers so we can make future documentaries. Visit InfoWars.com. Purchase the high-quality hard case DVD that has over 30 minutes of expanded extras. Make copies of that because it's the best quality available. Give it to everyone you know. Have public showings, whether it's the library, a local theater, or your home. Get it out to everyone you know. Get a PrisonPlanet.tv membership. Download all my films in high quality. Burn them to disc and give them to everyone in your community. If we expose the globalist, there's no way they can carry out their hellish plan. The destiny of this film is in your hands. You've made our previous films incredible successes. I'm counting on you now. So again, InfoWars.com, you get the DVD, or call toll-free, 888-253-3139, or see them all in incredible high quality at PrisonPlanet.tv. The ball is in your court. PrisonPlanet.tv is a better tool than ever in the info war. Over six years of my radio and TV shows, all my films in super high quality, my book, Paul Watson's book, all there, 15 cents a day. Your support of PrisonPlanet.tv empowers the resistance to unlock minds worldwide. Hi. My name's Jason, and I used to be just a good old average American kid living in upstate New York. There's me. I played baseball, mastered Mortal Kombat, went to the prom, said the Pledge of Allegiance every day, and loved my country. I even lived the dream of every American youth, college. Sure, it was a state school, but it also happened to be a party town. Great times all around, right? Well, sort of. I still had to work hard as a pizza guy to make it, and of course there was school. I had to figure out the computer graphics programs I was working with, as well as attend classes I didn't care about. I certainly didn't know much about geopolitics. Then 9-11 happened and everything changed. I was pissed. How dare the Muslim extremists massacre all those people? But was it all true? Prior to the invasion of Iraq, something didn't seem right. I then did a startling thing. I actually took a look at what happened that terrible September day. What I found horrified and angered me to such an extent that I took action. We were lied to and lied to big time. Before I knew it, I went from a normal college student to the political guy at the party to one of the guys that brought you the first internet blockbuster, Loose Change. The film would not only change my life, but countless others as well. So if you've ever seen Loose Change, the documentary about September 11th, conspiracy theorist documentary, it is riveting oh, like man. you watch it and by the end of, not even the end 10 minutes yeah, in you're, you're like you got your car packed your head <laughs> you're just like oh my god it's all true so every place there's questions coming from this documentary and you don't have to believe everything in the documentary to still have questions come up and you look back and you remember what you saw and what you were told and now you have questions we got the boogeyman out there. Wow. See, for many years it was communism, then it was the war on drugs, now it's the war on terror. All through our life we've had to have a boogeyman. Loose Change took the truth about 9-11 into the mainstream with over 100 million views and allowed me to travel the country and even take on some of my detractors. The answer is no, they cannot. 
Jason, I think it's it's telling that every time you disagree with something, you call the people a liar. I'm not calling anybody a liar, sir. I'm calling you a liar because you are a liar. But if we were lied to about 9-11, then who was really behind it? A lot of people on the web were pointing towards the new world order, but that was impossible. I mean, the Hulkster couldn't be involved, could he? So I set out to find out if the New World Order really existed. And if it did, what was it? Who was involved? And what were their goals? The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic, and ruthless conspiracy. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. Some cringe when they hear the term New World Order, despite all of these prominent people using it. The world that maybe some people dreamt of at that conference back in Bournemouth when it looked as if maybe history would end, that liberal democracy would triumph, that free market economics would slowly progress and we'd have a New World Order. And together they helped to create, were the principal leaders in creating, a new world order and a winning strategy in the Cold War. We are part of a new world order. And as the recently departed Admiral William J. Crow once said, it's long on new and it's short on order. Walter Isaacson wrote a wonderful book about some of the wise men who helped shape the New World Order following the Second World War. As we devise a way forward in Iraq, I urge the international community to embrace its responsibility for creating that New World Order, a New World Order based upon collective action. The transatlantic partnership was never just the foundation of our security. It was the foundation of our way of life. It was forged an experience of the most bitter and anguished kind. Out of it came a new Europe, a new world order, a new consensus as to how life should and could be lived. And just like that, it was gone. It was the, it was a new world order. That's what President George H. Bush said. Harvard historian Francis Fukuyama pronounced the end of history. In fact, when it is used, that person is often dismissed out of hand because of the perception that it is nothing more than a conspiracy theory. Actually, the idea of global governance in a one world order has been around for centuries. And the term new world order has been used frequently in recent history. The New World Order means different things to different people, um, but to those who expect to be in control of it, it means the same thing. It means all the world under their control. They believe that somebody must rule. After all, people are too darn dumb to know how to rule themselves. They figured that that's their role. The first in-depth publication of note was Samuel Zane Batten's work, The New World Order, which was published in 1919. Under the cloak of Christianity, this order speaks of a new world rising and advocates social control over all people and all resources. It promotes a world federation with a world parliament, an international court, and a global police force. Some of its goals are as follows. Community. The danger and loss in crime and degeneracy. The determination to make community life safe, sanitary, wholesome, and moral. Industrial. 
the disappearance of class distinctions, and the solidarity of all interests in the economic process. National, the conception of the nation's welfare as the supreme concern, with the policy that everything shall contribute to this end, and every person must do some useful work. International, the creation of an international mind with a world consciousness and a world patriotism, the destruction of every arbitrary power that can separately and of its single choice disturb the peace of the world. Well, government is good, right? It put an end to war. Well, it could put an end to war because you just only have one dictator. <laughs> Think Adolf Hitler had that in mind. He wanted a world government too, uh, with himself as the master leader. Many have regarded Hitler as the apex of evil, a true heart of darkness. But how many people know that Hitler had his own vision of a new world order? Hitler had been promoted by the establishment. He graced the cover of Time magazine many times and was their man of the year twice. His vision was simple, unify Europe and then the world. The only real difference was that his order was racially motivated instead of being based solely on religion. He even wrote a lesser known follow-up to Mein Kampf in 1928 that many have dubbed My Order or New World Order. President Roosevelt would condemn this order prior to World War II. Nazi forces openly seek to establish systems of government based on the religion of the people. Nazi forces openly seek to The idea of globalization was so prominent in Nazi ideology that the 1936 Berlin Games would be the first time that the Olympic rings would be displayed prominently and promoted in order to glorify the Third Reich. This symbol represents the five major regions of the world, Africa, America, Asia, Europe, and Oceania, interlocking and coming together as one. This one world philosophy still defines the Olympic Games today. Australia, hello and welcome. One world, one dream. Hitler's methods of youth corps, concentration camps, eugenics, and military aggression were so visible to the rest of the world, he eventually failed. However, his vision of a new world order lived on. Author H.G. Wells, the man behind the time machine and War of the Worlds, would write about a planned world state in which there must be a common faith and law for mankind. In 1939, he would publish a full book on the matter called The New World Order. Wells again has a similar vision stating that national individualism has to go and that sovereign states must end. He then goes on to write, in the great struggle to evoke westernized world socialism, contemporary governments may vanish. Perhaps his most chilling prediction is that countless people will hate the new world order, be rendered unhappy by frustration and their passions and ambitions through its advent, and will die protesting against it many of them quite gallant and graceful-looking people. Collectivism is that concept where individuals are uh, considered to be uh, discardable and that the group is more important and that uh, the ultimate group, of course, is the state. And so it boils down eventually to the fact that the state is the all-important uh, unit of society and citizens exist only to serve the state. Other men of prominence would also promote a new world order during the 1960s, including industrialist and former New York governor, Nelson Rockefeller. These are some of the reasons pressing us to lead vigorously towards the true building of a new world order. Rockefeller would also become vice president under Gerald Ford. Religious leader Pope Paul VI, delegates to international organizations, public officials, gentlemen of the press, teachers and educators, all of you must realize that you have your part to play in the construction of a new world order. As well as former President Richard Nixon. And the hope that each of us has to build a new world order. However, Nixon was largely a mouthpiece for his most dominant advisor, Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. 
Kissinger may be the most vocal proponent for a new world order of his era. He has called for it time and time again, in policy papers, meetings, and interviews. Time magazine recognized both Nixon and Kissinger as men of the year after announcing their new world order in China. However, they were working on it long before. In these once classified documents, they both discussed the new order with the president of Indonesia. Mainstream media was even critical of Kissinger's vision in the early 70s. In ragged, spasmodic fashion, a new world order is coming into being, but it looks less and less like the world order that Mr. Kissinger had constructed in his own mind. Kissinger's new world order would fall under the radar for some time. However, it saw a vast revival during the first Bush administration. Here is Brent Scowcroft, former vice chairman of Kissinger Associates and former national security advisor under both Ford and Bush Sr. as he discusses the new world order. Looking at the uh, subtitle this morning, Are We Ready for the New World Order? Uh, gives me something of the shudders, that uh, phrase, New World Order, I'm afraid I'm partly responsible for resurrecting. To me, what that symbolized was perhaps a fundamental change in the character, uh, in character of our response to national security issues. Here, Charlie Rose asked Scowcroft, Kissinger, and former national security advisors of Big New Brzezinski if we are living in a new world order. Where are we as we think about this time in American foreign policy? Are we at a special moment which is being redefined? Or are we creating a new world order? We're at a moment when the international system is in a period of change like we haven't seen for several hundred years. Uh, in uh, some parts of the world, the nation state on which the existing international system was based is either uh, giving up its traditional aspects, like in Europe, or as in the Middle East. George H.W. Bush would campaign for a new world order like no other president before him. He would openly discuss it during his State of the Union address. What is at stake is more than one small country. It is a big idea, a new world order, where diverse nations are drawn together in common cause to achieve the universal aspirations of mankind. Again, a unified Europe was a major goal in creating this order. With few exceptions, the world now stands as one. A year and a half ago, in Germany, I said that our goal was a Europe whole and free. Tonight, Germany is united. Europe has become whole and free. The world can therefore seize this opportunity to fulfill the long-held promise of a new world order. We can find meaning and reward by serving some higher purpose than ourselves. A shining purpose, the illumination of a thousand points of light. Bush Sr. and his administration would tour and promote this agenda across the board at any given opportunity. The president has spoken often of a new world order. And we have an unprecedented opportunity to build a new era of peace and prosperity here and abroad, to build a new world order. It's my understanding, I think, that the president, and I, I don't know the context of, of how it uh, came up in his speech last night in New York, said that China must be a part of the new world order. I guess I would like to ask you how you envision China fitting into the new world order. It is a country that uh, we are going to uh, uh, have relationships uh, with by virtue of its uh, geopolitical uh, importance. American officials say breaking down regional and national barriers to the flow of goods and services would represent a spectacular benefit to economies around the world. We are building a new world order. Bush would actually make a commencement address at Maxwell Air Force Base declaring the birth of this order. And that's why I wanted to speak to you today about the new world taking shape around us, about the prospects 
for a new world order now within our reach. In the coming weeks, I'll be talking in some detail about the possibility of a new world order emerging after the Cold War. But today, I want to discuss another aspect of that order. You see, as the Cold War drew to an end, we saw the possibilities of a new order in which nations work together. It refers to new ways of working with other nations to deter aggression and to achieve stability. As old threats recede, new threats emerge. The quest for the new world order is in part a challenge to keep the dangers of disorder at bay. We must build on the successes of Desert Storm to give new shape and momentum to this new world order. Only when this transformation is complete will we be able to take full measure of the opportunities presented by this new and involving world order. The new world order really is a tool for addressing a new world of possibilities. This order gains its mission and shape not just from shared interests, but from shared ideals. After the Gulf War had ended, Bush was so obsessed with the idea of a new world order that he had a series of glocks imprinted with the term that he would give to members of his administration, including Colin Powell, Brent Scowcroft, Dick Cheney, and General Norman Schwarzkopf. Cheney would even approve policy papers regarding the New World Order. Defense Secretary Dick Cheney has approved a revised draft of a policy document on the New World Order. The Pentagon is backing off a controversial earlier draft and has abandoned a one superpower strategy. The final document puts more emphasis on international alliances and organizations. This would become an unprecedented time period for people all over the globe to discuss at length what the New World Order meant to them. People within the media. Does anybody want to talk about the New World Order? Is there a New World Order out there, or is this uh, a vision that's, that exists in the... He had, does have his vision, there's no doubt about that. But does that exist in the president's mind, or does it exist out there in reality? This president sees this episode as the first test case, as the first example for the New World Order he is trying to organize. Some people have called it the New World Disorder, and there's a lot of truth to that. University and institutional chairs. I mean, we're talking a new world order at Georgetown. <laughs> and we'd like to be very much a part of it and continue to live. This is a world that is likely to be dominated in the near future, and perhaps longer, by the Gulf War and the new world order, which is the buzzword of the moment. So the secret of a new world order, and at this point it's just a slogan, but it does have some historical background in terms that orders have succeeded each other over time. The secret of this is to learn how to use coalitions. We are effective in the United Nations. People within government. George Bush has invoked a new world order without enunciating a new American purpose. The president has still failed to articulate clear goals for our nation's foreign policy in this new age. I find the term New World Order very revolting, and just not only historically, but uh, politically today. I think Harding is absolutely right, and the actions of the administration just after enunciation of the New World Order put the lie to the fact there is any real substance behind what they say is New World Order. The first act of the New World Order was A, to make war, and then B, was to sell arms all over again. Is there a New World Order? Uh, we know certainly that George Bush has uh, copyrighted the term at this point. In the aftermath of this war, though, is it an empty vessel into which uh, something will be poured? Is it the appropriate term to use? Is it going to be a New World Order, or will disorder uh, be just as significant in this process as we look ahead. Uh, let's start with Madeline. I think that we have, in fact, kind of had this term thrown at us, and many of us have not liked it, uh, partially because of the previous historical connotation, and partially because I think it doesn't really deal with the way the world ought to be or is at the moment. 
but we are far from uh, seeing a world order, and I'm not sure that it is in best U.S. interest to have a new world order in which we are the policemen. While many began to become critical of this order, the term began to evaporate into the background. We are very, very skeptical of an international order if we are not sure how the rules will be made, because thus far the international order has been made with rules that we had no input into and that affect us. And even when, in the few, on the few occasions when the rules will seem to favor us, then they get changed. A unipolar world, a world of one superpower, may be quite dangerous for us. A new world order under the United Nations would mean, among other things, an end to our God-given rights given us and secured by the Constitution. The New World Order, which now has, uh, uh, has been called by some the New World Disorder and, and by uh, some people on the more, of a more liberal persuasion, uh, the taking over of uh, uh, the world by the Council on Foreign Relations, the Trilateral Commission and the UN to uh, put us all in slavery. But what are these organizations? Who founded them? And what are the stated goals of each? Before we begin with the Council on Foreign Relations, let's delve further into history to understand roundtable groups and their origins. Its roots go way, way back in history. and They go back to the formation of a secret society, a secret organization that was created by Cecil Rhodes, a very powerful and very wealthy individual. And people have heard about him in history, and they know about the Rhodes Scholarship, and they think, well, isn't that nice? But they don't understand at all what that's all about. Cecil Rhodes, when he died, left his great fortune not to his family, not to his heirs, but for the creation of a secret society. And we know about this because uh, there were some people very intimately involved with this organization who wrote about it. One of the best authors on this topic is Professor Carol Quigley. He wrote several books and um, Tragedy and Hope is the best known of his. He described in detail the secret organization created by Cecil Rhodes, and he explains in these books he knows about them because he was invited by the organization uh, into its uh, inner circle. He was never a member of it, but he was invited in as their historian, and he was allowed to see their secret records and papers and study them for several years. And he knew all the important players, and he understood what it was about, and so he wrote these books it's an amazing thing because he laid out in great detail what the purpose of the organization was and uh, how they were the major players in all of the, of the big international events since and including World War I. The bottom line is that you take the roots of that organization and you find out that they created in all of the British dependencies um, what they call round table groups. And uh, then around those little round table groups they created front groups. And the purpose of these front groups and roundtable groups was to penetrate into the governments of all of these different uh, countries, to penetrate into the media centers, to penetrate into the educational systems. In other words, to penetrate into the social fabric, the power centers of society, and literally take them over from the inside without anybody being aware that they were controlling influence. After World War I, the International League of Nations arose as a precursor to the United Nations in 1919 under what seemed to be the vision of President Woodrow Wilson and his 14 points. The League of Nations was the first attempt at the New World Order, uh, the first attempt at a global government based on the model of collectivism. And it was the uh, brainchild of the elitists, the, the ancestors of the very people who are still working on this project. They're collectivists, the very wealthy people. They're the ones in this country who dominated the powerful tax-exempt foundations like the Carnegie Endowment Fund for International Peace, the Rockefeller Funds, the Ford Foundation, and groups like that. These people were on record, even way back then, that they had to have a new world government, and they dreamed of that being embodied in the League of Nations. And they were solidly behind it. And that was one of the reasons those people encouraged the United States into World War I, was because of the crisis of World War I, and that would also condition Americans to thinking of making big changes in their system, because we certainly don't want another war like that, do we? It was that fear angle again. 
And they thought, well, by being in World War I, then we would be a major participant at the table to carve up the world and create a new world government. And that was to be the League of Nations. Well, what happened to it is that the American people didn't really go for it. Wilson was aware of the elite and their control over society. In his book, The New Freedom, published in 1913, he discussed such a group. Since I entered politics, I have chiefly had men's views confided to me privately. Some of the biggest men in the United States, in the field of commerce and manufacture, are afraid of something. They know that there is a power somewhere so organized, so subtle, so watchful, so interlocked, so complete, so pervasive, that they better not speak above their breath when they speak in condemnation of it. Ultimately, this insight did not spare him from becoming yet another puppet of the global elite. In all of the British dependencies, these organizations, the front groups, were called the Royal Institute for International Affairs. In the United States, they chose a different name. They chose the Council on Foreign Relations, but it held exactly the same relationship to this inner society of uh, Cecil Rhodes. Among the charter members were W. Averill Harriman of Union Banking, then President of the United States Woodrow Wilson's main advisor, Colonel Edward Mendel House, John D. Rockefeller, the founder of Standard Oil, banking mogul J.P. Morgan, and prominent bankster Paul Warburg. Well, the Council on Foreign Relations exists today. It's probably the most powerful single organization in America. Many uh, observers, including myself, believe that it is the hidden uh, government of the United States. These people are not elected to office, and most uh, Americans don't even know who they are. Uh, but they are holding all of the important positions in society. There are only about 4,000 of them in the United States. But I don't care what organization you want to look at, whether it's government or whether it's universities or the large media centers or whatever it is, you look at the people at the tops of those organizations, the owners, the managers, the CEOs, the board of directors, and I'm going to say probably 80 to 90 percent of the great power centers of America are dominated by just those 4,000 people who are members of the Council on Foreign Relations. Throughout its history, it would contain extremely influential and powerful individuals in finance, business, media, and politics. Former presidents of the United States include Richard Nixon, Gerald Ford, Jimmy Carter, and William Jefferson Clinton. Currently, Barack Obama claims not to be a member, but has spoken in front of the council and has had his writings published in the council's magazine, Foreign Affairs. It's been reported that um, you and your wife are in the globalist CFR, which is a council on foreign relations. I'd like to know if that is true. Well, first of all, uh, I'm, I'm not... Uh, the, the council on foreign relations... Uh, I don't know if I'm a official member. I have sp I've spoken there before. Uh, it basically is just a forum where a bunch of people talk about foreign policy. Uh, and so there's nothing, uh, there, there's no official membership. I don't have a card or, you know, a special handshake or anything like that. Now, why is that important? It's important because the avowed purpose of the Council on Foreign Relations is to create a new world order, a global government based on the model of collectivism. And that includes the elimination of the United States as a sovereign nation. That's why it's important. The people running this country are determined to destroy it. The council was heavily criticized during the 1980s for being an organization hell-bent on destroying national sovereignty in favor of a world government. So many of its members hid their association with the organization. Dick Cheney had this to say in response to a question by David Rockefeller, who became the CFR's youngest director in 1949 and was chairman of the board from 1970 to 1985. He remains an honorary chairman to this day. It's good to be back at the Council on Foreign Relations, as uh, Pete mentioned. I been a member for a long time and was actually a director for some period of time. I never mentioned that when I was campaigning for re-election back home in Wyoming. 
Now, you are the president of the Council on Foreign Relations, all right? Yes, sir. You guys toy with, the, with countries of the world like, uh, like, well, like toys, don't you? You're like the Illuminati. You're the Masons. You control everything, don't you? That's the rap on you guys. What's so interesting now, though, is who's on the chessboard. It's the toys, if you will, are a lot more than states. Notice that Mr. Haas does not deny that the CFR has massive control over the geopolitical arena and instead tries to focus on the separate entities outside of nation states. Current Secretary of State Hillary Clinton also reveals the importance of the CFR here. Uh, but it's good to have an outpost of the council right here down the street from the State Department. Uh, we get a lot of advice from the council, so this will mean I won't have as far to go to uh, be told uh, what we should be doing and uh, how uh, we should uh, think about the future. You have these private groups that are run and created by the elite, uh, by the ultra-rich, wealthy families that have been manipulating global markets from behind the scenes for generations. They create these private groups that then feed information to the government, to senators, to congressmen, their recommendations, their policy papers, what they think should happen. And it's fascinating because if you actually read what it is that they're doing, uh, the recommendations that they make, they're very able to get them put in place. Discussions that are going on in these private groups are really talks that should be going on in Senate committees and in the halls of Congress, but they're happening with these ultra-elite groups that are then pushing their propaganda into the political mainstream, and then it's becoming enacted, it's becoming put into law. Still not convinced the CFR is promoting a new world order? Listen to what Leslie Gelb had to say upon leaving the New York Times to chair the organization as its president in 1993. Uh, I loved it. Doing a column is a great job. I'm going to an equally great but different job, and in a, in a way a job that, that caps everything I've been doing in my life, in government, in academia, and in journalism. Uh, I think that's what the, the Council on Foreign Relations will allow me to do. Well, you know, for example, uh, you had me and uh, three or four other folks on this show a few months ago Apparently, to House, talk about right. the New World Order, right? right? Exactly. Right? Bob I talk about it. New, exactly. Right. I talk about it all the time. New World Order wants a global system where one small central authority of individuals can then dictate a policy that's going to be distributed down to the rest of the world, everywhere, in the smallest little town in the middle of nowhere in, in some remote country. I now think it's safe to say that the Council is extremely influential on the world stage and openly promote global governance. The Council and the globalists were able to take this agenda to the next level following World War II. The United Nations was born out of the ashes of this conflict. Unlike the League of Nations, the United States not only joined this organization, they championed it. The first book I wrote was uh, The Fearful Master, A Second Look at the United Nations. It was written at a time when it was not popular to be critical of the UN. I mean, the United Nations was viewed by almost everybody as our last best hope for peace. It was a means, we were told, to bring humanity together and put an end to war and live in peace and harmony and promote trade and all of these good things. I wish it were any of those things, but it's not. The original charter for the United Nations was drafted in San Francisco in 1945 and the United States became a permanent member of the Security Council, along with France, the United Kingdom, the Soviet Union, and the Republic of China. The process by which other nations' belief systems could be used to erode and eviscerate our Constitution and Bill of Rights had taken a giant leap forward. The United Nations is one of the most well-known sort of globalization attempts. Its primary goal is to streamline all the governments of the world, to create a global council, and to unify all the rules and all the regulations for the world. So it's essentially the precursor uh, and an engine of this new world order. The United Nations is made up of all of the countries of the world, most of which are dictatorships of one kind or another. And you don't take a bunch of dictatorships and put them into a bag and shake it up and come out with a a freedom-loving uh, governmental unit. You come out with a global dictatorship. This was the public face of global governance. However, many other organizations have been birthed since. 
Even more suspect is a private group called the Trilateral Commission. David Rockefeller and Henry Kissinger are among its some 300 influential members. The Trilateral Commission, rich and powerful business and political leaders from Japan, Europe and North America. The New York-based policy group was formed in 1973 by Chase Manhattan Bank Chairman David Rockefeller. In addition to Rockefeller, there are many other noted American members. Among them, economist Alan Greenspan, former Defense Secretary Harold Brown. George Bush was once a member, but resigned last year before his unsuccessful presidential campaign. Back then, it wasn't politically wise to be aligned with what his party's right wing considered a shadow world government. The United Nations would take over America. The Trilateral Commission would control the world. Just look at its membership, they say. Current and former members include Presidents Clinton, Bush, and Carter. Names like Brzezinski, Christopher, Kissinger, and Schultz. And top executives of ITT, Xerox, Exxon, and Nations Bank. Although this group with only 300 members seems to be at the apex of the power structure, there is yet another group formed in 1954 that is even smaller in number and has a greater influence on world events. Meet the Bilderberg Group. This elite group meet annually around the globe. There is a core group of members who have attended every year for decades, such as David Rockefeller, Henry Kissinger, and Queen Beatrix of the Netherlands. These members invite others who are politically and socially relevant at the time. Each year, around 140 people are in attendance. Tell me the truth. I did, all I did was go. They had a, a Republican and a Democrat. And a Republican. I gave I gave like a 20 minute call call with all the president. Did it have anything to do with being John Kerry's running mate? Or are you talking about that at all? No, because I wasn't his running mate. Okay. I happened to be in Europe then on my way to Russia. I was invited to go to Bilderberg by Vernon Jordan, a friend of mine and a genuine hero of the civil rights movement. And to the best of my knowledge, NAFTA was not discussed by anybody in my presence. Documents released by the group in 2001 reveal that in September of 1955, the group met in Germany and covertly outlined the idea of a European Union. Section E, European Unity, discusses the general support for European integration and unification, and the idea to unify Germany once again with the rest of Europe under a common marketplace. Belgian Viscount and current Bilderberg Chairman Etienne Davignon told the EU Observer in 2009 that the next Bilderberg meeting could improve understanding on future action in the same way it helped create the Euro in the 1990s. This illustrates the patience, vision, and reach of this organization. It was able to promote and establish both the European Union and a European currency over the course of just under 40 years, incrementally. One of the things that the um, elitists discussed back at the turn of the century when they were talking about how do you convert the United States into a collectivist system was the fact that you can't do it quickly. You have to let people get used to it incrementally because any major change would be rejected. The 1957 Conference of Rome, where the Common Market Treaty, providing for free trade in all products, was at last signed. Six nations, France, Germany, Italy, Belgium, Holland, and Luxembourg, agreed to remove all mutual barriers to trade within 12 to 15 years, the embryo of a political union which they proclaimed to be their ultimate objective. In that fashion, it's possible for people to get used to this process and even to think it's a good thing. People will accept uh, the gradual uh, growth of government, the gradual loss of their purchasing power. Uh, they'll accept almost anything if it's done gradually. And we have to be very alert to that. 2008 and 2009 attendees include World Bank President Robert Zolik, Treasury Secretary Timothy Geithner, former head of British Secret Intelligence Richard Dearlove, Donald Graham, CEO of the Washington Post, CNN host and author of The Post-American World, Fareed Zakaria, and many other giants of business, politics, and media. 
you just came back from meeting with the Bilderberg Group. The Bilderberg Group are, you know, I, when, when people who are conspiracy theory, theory people, I, they send me mail. It's usually about the Bilderberg Group. And I get these books in my front door, which I'm uncomfortable with. But, and it's all about the Bilderberg Group, like they're the modern day Illuminati. Are you a member of the Bilderberg Group? Uh, uh, <laughs> I don't think we're supposed to talk about this. Many have identified them as the kingmakers the puppet masters that pull the strings behind the scenes. Perhaps there is no better example of this than what occurred during the 2008 conference. Immediately after Obama had been selected as the Democratic presidential nominee, the pressure was on to choose a running mate. We've put together a committee. We are going to uh, be equally deliberative in how we move forward. And we're not going to do it in the press room. We're not going to do it through surrogates. He then tricked the press corps into staying on the plane as it took off from Washington. He was whisked away to an undisclosed location. Uh, Obama was supposed to fly home. He'd been here in Virginia. He was supposed to fly home out of Dulles, uh, as you know, outside Washington, D.C. Uh, the press corps was waiting for him on the plane, and uh, the pilot announced that they were leaving, and Barack Obama was not on the plane. Presumptive nominees in the past has always been that they have the, at least a press pool with them at all times. Is there a reason why we didn't go with him in the motorcade all the way? Um, this is what we're out here for, and now we're on this plane with no candidate. Again, I, you know, he look. These, the, I, I understand that he he uh, there was a, a desire to do these meetings, obviously in private. The press then began to report that Obama and Hillary were meeting secretly in her home. Well, we continue to follow our breaking news. Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton meeting tonight at her house in Washington, D.C. However, it was later revealed that they never actually met at Clinton's home. And we're following this breaking story. Candy Crowley, we understand it's new information. Candy, what have you learned? Uh, we are hearing actually from Chris Welsh, who is our embed with the Obama campaign. Those are the people that took off uh, without Obama and went to Chicago. Uh, the spokesman there is, in fact, confirming that the meeting did take place. They're talking in past tense now, uh, but saying that the meeting did not take place at the Clintons' house. Uh, it took place at, at this point at some place, I don't know where, some undisclosed uh, place in Washington, D.C., not at Hillary Clinton's house. Remember, Gibbs mentioned that Obama had a desire to have several meetings, not just one. Is there more than one meeting? Is there more than one person with whom I'm not going to get into all the details of the meetings. I, 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 I don't know that I've got a ton more different answers for all of your questions. The truth of the matter is that Bilderberg just happened to be in the neighborhood at the time. They were holding their annual meeting just down the road in Chantilly, Virginia. What are the chances? What's interesting and dangerous about the New World Order is that it's not a natural progressing idea. It's just not civilization naturally evolving and organizing into this system. It's the group of extremely powerful people that are manipulating the system to get it to this status from behind the scenes without anybody's knowledge. You have to ask yourself if there isn't an agenda going on to keep those organizations quiet and to keep them out of the news, to keep the discussions about them behind closed doors, then why is it that these supposed experts on the left and on the right never talk about them? This has been a condensed history of the globalist organizations and their rise to power. But is there a reason they meet behind closed doors? A shadow world government has been mentioned. But to truly understand what that means, let's go back to this iconic warning from President Dwight D. Eisenhower. Progress toward these noble goals is persistently threatened by the conflict now engulfing the world. It commands our whole attention, absorbs our very beings. We face a hostile ideology, global in scope, atheistic in character, ruthless in purpose, and insidious in method. Unhappily, the danger it poses promises to be of indefinite duration the need to maintain balance in and among national programs. Balance between the private and the public economy. Balance between the cost and hoped for advantages. Balance between the clearly necessary and the comfortably desirable. We have been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry of vast proportions. We annually spend on military security alone more than the net income of all United States corporations. 
the total influence, economic, political, even spiritual, is felt in every city, every state house, every office of the federal government. Yet we must not fail to comprehend its grave implications. Our toil, resources, and livelihood are all involved. So is the very structure of our society. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. America went into a major mobilization, uh, re revived its defense industries, and we saw the civilian economy of America more and more skewed through the 50s. Already in Eisenhower's time, he could see it coming, that you, you were getting a larger and larger defense military component of the economy, which, unlike the rest of the economy, was very, very centrally organized about lobbying for more and more new weapons. It was the political skills of this uh, military-industrial complex, which I think Eisenhower was really warning us about, and rightly. There is a military-industrial complex. Today, we see a situation where the civilian economy is really in tatters, and most of our civilian production has gone overseas to uh, third world countries. What do we export? Our biggest export practically is garbage, but uh, apart from garbage, we export military equipment. Uh, we have a, a special act which uh, subsidizes, uh, makes it possible for countries abroad to buy our armaments because it's too expensive to produce them for one country only. Uh, so we have become a very efficient military industrial complex, but the civilian economy is only a ghost of what it used to be. And this has terrible consequences for democracy because it means that the power of this lobby is now uh, sort of dominating what goes on in Washington. Through multinational corporations, global intelligence networks, out-of-control banksters, all under the veil of national security and black operations. The global elite have consolidated power on a massive scale over the last several decades. You see, global corporations not only fund and develop large technological and military projects here and abroad, they also own the consumer industry and production, as well as all of the important media. By owning the vast majority of what we hear and see on a daily basis, we have been manipulated on a mass scale as to regards to what we believe and desire, both socially and politically. Edward Bernays, the nephew of world-famous psychoanalyst Sigmund Freud, would study group dynamics and become the father of public relations. He authored the book Propaganda in 1928. In it, he described how to intelligently and consciously manipulate the habits and opinions of the masses within a democratic society. He went on to state that those who harness this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government and are the true ruling power. It is they who pull the wires which control the public mind, who harness old social forces and contrive new ways to bind and guide the world. The average American is distracted, mindless, worried about minuscule things, celebrities as if it was their own family members. And this is by design because the powers that be who own the media know how our brains work. They know scientifically how the human mind functions. They know about sociology and they are using the media and have used the media for decades now to entertain people with issues that don't really matter. When you have the big news networks covering celebrity issues as if it's the most important thing, it becomes the most important thing. And this is not by accident, this is to keep us out of the way. Because if you're worried about the latest celebrity death or the latest celebrity couple or the, the celebrity breakup or your, your sports team um, having a shot at the Super Bowl or the World Series, there's so much information about those issues that can be discussed 
that will mesmerize people and they won't know or care about the real issues that are out there. Well, I think this is just one more piece of evidence of the degree to which the media, supposedly the watchdogs, uh, has become the gatekeeper of the system. Mainstream media are, first of all, nearly all of them corporations, nearly all of them now publicly held, part of the whole Wall Street uh, financial system that they're supposed to report about objectively, but they can't. They, uh, right now, in uh, October of 2009, they are celebrating the recovery of the biggest banks in New York and saying that the recession is over. Of course, there are a few problems, like foreclosures are going on, unemployment is rising. All of this is affecting the American people, but it's not affecting the financial elite who also control the media. Bernays successfully identified the invisible empire which controlled the minds of men. So as the populace is mesmerized and hypnotized by powerful behind the scenes forces, as they are distracted by the latest celebrity scandal, the newest cell phone, and their favorite sports team, this network disguises itself, remaining in the shadows. Despite the elite utilizing Bernays methods, in conjunction with the military-industrial complex they had erected, a modern arm of this organization was exposed in what came to be known as the Iran-Contra scandal. Essentially, black operations were not only caught dealing arms illegally and supporting South American dictators, but also smuggling drugs into the United States. Iran-Contra was really the merging of two different programs. Uh, the first one was support for the Contras, who were, let's face it, a force of terrorists in uh, Nicaragua trying to overthrow the Sandinista government. They were being secretly supported by the CIA. And at the bottom of the whole thing was drugs. Iran-Contra was openly exposed by massive network coverage. How was it that in three years, a network Washington set up to run arms to the Contras wound up running cocaine into this country for the most vicious drug cartel in the world. At the same time, we were supposed to be fighting a war against drugs. But by the same token, I also smuggled my share of weapons in exchange for those illegal substances with the full knowledge and assistance of both the DEA and CIA. Betzner says that in 1983, he flew weapons from Florida to El Salvador and drugs from Colombia to the Bahamas on the way back. In 1984, he says, he flew twice from Florida to Costa Rica and back. We could bring back our own cargo, and they would arrange it, or we could bring back their cargo without ever having to worry about interception, arrest, anything like this, that everything was taken care of. What kind of cargo were you talking about? Drugs. Tolliver says he had two meetings with this man, CIA veteran Rafael Quintero. Then in March of 1986, he says he flew 14 tons of weapons down to Honduras, to this Contra resupply base set up by the CIA. We take off from Tegucigalpa, Honduras, and we leave. To? South Florida. Where in South Florida? We landed at Homestead. Homestead? Air Force Base. This is the plane Tolliver says he used. The plane traces to a company that had a State Department contract to fly humanitarian supplies to the Contras. In addition to that, three dozen sources confirm the basic scheme. We can now report that long before that operation began, there was another operation to provide guns for the Contras, which was also against the law. In this operation, Americans and Israelis provided arms to the Contras, and then the same network smuggled drugs into the United States. The operation was launched in spring of 1983 at Washington's request, with at least $20 million of Israeli government money later reimbursed, we're told, from U.S. covert operations funds. For about five years, uh, people were flying arms into Iran, and most of them came from Israel. The Israelis purchased the weapons from Poland and Czechoslovakia and began shipping them secretly from Yugoslavia to Bolivia and then to Panama. The Israeli liaison man there, this man, Michael Harari, until recently a close aide to Panama's strongman, General Manuel Noriega. You'd bring the ship into Colombia, you would load drugs aboard it, and you would bring those drugs back to Panama with you. But bringing that stuff into the United States, that was something else. I, I've never been so thoroughly disgusted with myself in my life. This network would also be involved in the October surprise. We really can't understand that unless we understand 
the so-called October Surprise in the 1980 election, which is, uh, I think, unquestionably Republicans, including uh, William Casey, who later became Reagan's head of the CIA, negotiated with the Iranians for them not to release the hostages which were being held in Iran to Carter, but to wait until the uh, Carter was defeated and the Republicans were in. That is what actually happened, that the hostages were only released on the day that Carter left office and Reagan came in. Unbelievably, this same network would even be linked to the BCCI banking scandal by journalist Danny Casolaro. Casolaro was probing a conspiracy he called the octopus, which involved the Iranian hostage crisis, the Iran-Contra affair, with, believe it or not, all funds channeled through BCCI, the international bank charged with everything from money laundering to fraud. BCCI, it's a shadowy international bank linked to terrorists, drug runners, and dictators. Little was known about BCCI until six of its top officers were arrested in Tampa in October of 1988 on charges of laundering drug money for Colombian cocaine bosses. The BCCI men were convicted and the bank itself pleaded guilty. But for some reason, the bank was allowed to continue to operate all over the world. There are indications that some of the reluctance to prosecute this bank stem for the fa from the favors it did for the favors it did for intelligence services everywhere. Too many secrets of too many countries, too many prominent people, too many hands-on, and that makes it desirable that this entire affair be forgotten. It began to become clear that the global traffic of drugs were funding violent dictators, rigging elections, supporting the arms trade, and enforcing the assassination of anyone who got in the way. Casalero was found dead for his efforts in exposing this network. His death, of course, ruled a suicide. He was meeting a source in West Virginia. He was about to discover all. Instead, his body was discovered in a hotel room with 12 slashes in his wrist. But when the local authorities ruled it suicide, the family said, no way. The housekeeper had taken calls threatening his life. And I pick it up telephone. I say, hello. And he say to me, you son of a bitch, you's dead. Casalero would not be the only person involved in the scandal to wind up in a casket. Meet Barry Seal. At first, the media portrayed Seal as a drug dealer gone good, who was assassinated by the Colombian Mafia. Authorities believe last night's machine gun killing of top drug informant Barry Seal was ordered by drug bosses in Medellin, Colombia, who sent five men to Baton Rouge to kill Seal. Sam Dalton was the lawyer that represented the Colombian hitmen convicted of his assassination. We were trying to subpoena the CIA because we felt like they had documents, exhibits, and evidence that would indicate complicity in Seal's assassination. When they were able to gain access of Barry Seal's trunk the night of the murder, the personal phone number of none other than George H.W. Bush was present. Louis Unglesby, the former attorney for Mr. Seal, also confirms that he once called the office of the vice president after Seal had given him the number. You see, the black ops drug smuggling operation had not yet been exposed, and intelligence couldn't take any chances. It was later revealed that Seal was involved in smuggling cocaine into Mena, Arkansas, while Bill Clinton sat as governor. 1983, Ronald Reagan was president, Bill Clinton was governor. And little Mina, Arkansas, changed from a quiet town to a center for drug smuggling and reported Contra support activity. In the middle of it all, this man, admitted dope smuggler Barry Seal. Arkansas State Trooper Russell Welch investigated Seal's organization. Each trip would have uh, 250 to 350 pounds of cocaine. According to the London Telegraph, Arkansas State Trooper Larry Patterson testified under oath that he and his officers discussed repeatedly in Clinton's presence. The large quantities of drugs being flown into Mena Airport, large quantities of money, large quantities of guns. Hot Springs police officers would also record Roger Clinton, Bill's brother, during a cocaine transaction stating, gotta get some for my brother. He's got a nose like a vacuum cleaner. There was also a large amount of money laundering going on in Mena. Former IRS agent William Duncan traced some of Seal's drug profits laundered through MENA banks. We had direct testimony from people who were involved in the money laundering operation. 
We had testimony from people at banks who observed the transactions. What happened when you tried to make this case before a grand jury? I was never asked to present the evidence to a grand jury, ever. This very same network used BCCI to fund the Afghani rebels. The deputy director of the CIA, Richard Kerr, said late today that the CIA did use the Bank of Credit and Commerce International, BCCI, to support CIA activities overseas. Most people still believe that the Soviets had maliciously invaded Afghanistan in order to spread their communist agenda. The Al-Qaeda was essentially a kind of in, a byproduct of Brzezinski's campaign to embarrass the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. They, they weren't in Afghanistan at that time. Brzezinski boasted later that he was uh, responsible for drawing them into Afghanistan. And he did this extraordinary interview with uh, Le Nouvel Observateur in France, and they said, but aren't you worried that you've uh, created this whole new force of uh, Al-Qaeda? And he said, oh, what's more important, a few crazed Islamists or the fall of the Berlin Wall? And uh, they said, but you know, is there no danger? Isn't, aren't they dangerous? And he said, nonsense. He said all this in 1998. Uh, <laughs> So um, I consider, I knew Brzezinski in, at, at McGill University. We were students together and took very small classes together. And in some ways he's bright and in some ways he's kind of nuts. And um, he's, he had the kind of nuttiness that uh, made him attractive to the Rockefellers. Bin Laden and his network were actually funded by BCCI through U.S. covert operations. Well, the reason I bring it up, if you've ever heard any of our call-in shows, you know that we have people that uh, think about the conspiracy theories mm -hmm. of people like you. Uh, you would be a poster child for these people because you have served on the board of the Council on Foreign Relations. You started, helped start the Trilateral Commission, and you've been to the Bilderberger Group. Too, are people too close in this world, uh, people in business, too close to the, the governments? Well... You know, there, there is such a thing as insidious influence. And the question is, how does it operate? Does it involve bribery? And does it involve some sort of psychological domination of individuals? I don't believe in this notion of some sort of secret societies controlling people. But, of course, in any political system, there are sort of over-the-table and under-the-table arrangements. Arrangements that involved ruthless, illegal, and immoral activities in order to dominate humanity. Despite all of the evidence that has just been presented, this network would fall down the memory hole, even though 14 convictions were made in the Iran-Contra scandal. The continued cover-up would be made possible by George H.W. Bush. Uh, these documents that came forward in the North trial uh, clearly reveal the involvement of the vice president to a greater degree, I think, than he has acknowledged heretofore. This, of course, did not stop him from pardoning those involved during the twilight of his presidency. Some new reverberations today to President Bush's Christmas Eve surprise, the pardoning of former Defense Secretary Caspar Weinberger and several others in connection with the Iran-Contra allegations. Well, now the special prosecutor says it's the president who needs to explain some things. The real issue is why the notes weren't produced five years ago when the congressional investigation and the independent counsel's investigation had requested them. Because high-level political officials scrambled to limit the investigation and establish plausible deniability for the upper echelons of the network, including Bush himself. So who is this guy? And how did he come to power? To understand that, we must first take a look at his father, Prescott. Prescott was born into privilege and became extremely influential in business, intelligence, and politics. He helped establish the CIA out of the Army's Office of Strategic Services with the Dulles Brothers and served as a senator in the state of Connecticut. However, during his time serving as one of the directors of Union Banking Corporation, he was doing business with Nazis. The Bushes have been sort of at the heart of the military-industrial complex since its very beginning and that Prescott was involved in a firm that uh, actually fronted for Nazi firms uh, in America. 
In fact, Union Banking and its subsidiaries were seized by the United States government in October of 1942 under the Trading with the Enemy Act. After the war, the assets were returned, a few fines were paid, and it was swept under the rug of forgotten history. These Nazi ties should not be all that shocking, seeing as it has been declassified that the Office of Strategic Services recruited Nazis into its ranks through Project Paperclip in August of 1945. George Bush seemed to follow in his father's footsteps, using Prescott's business connections to move to Texas and get into the oil industry. He would first attain political office as a Texas congressman in 1966, but then lose his bid as a Texas senator in 1970. It was at this time that Nixon appointed Bush as an ambassador to the United Nations. According to official accounts, Bush then began work with the CIA as its director in 1976. Evidence suggests that Mr. Bush and the CIA actually had a much longer standing relationship. There are indications that he had uh, relations to the CIA before. There's a very strange memo, and the names are George Bush. And when this was published, there was a lot of fuzzing of the issues. But given George H.W. Bush's strong connections with the Cuban community, uh, I think there is a good chance that it was uh, that the, the, the George Bush we know, so that he did have a CIA connection. Bush left the CIA just under a year after his appointment. He is credited with restoring the agency's morale, as its image was being shattered by the Church Committee's revelations of the CIA's unauthorized activities involving assassinations and corruption. In reality, Bush was responsible for denying the Church Committee many of the documents it requested and making it impossible for them to do a thorough investigation. After his time as CIA director, he devoted himself to becoming the next president of the United States. Many people within his own party did not like his globalist ties. Along the campaign trail, Bush continually had to explain his association with the group. You know J.R. Ewing in the show Dallas? J.R. is a member of the Trilateral Commission, I think. I, it's got to be because it's so bad. Let me tell you something. Uh, I, I used to be a member of it. I resigned, as I did from every business thing I was in, to concentrate on one thing, running for president of the United States. Ronald Reagan initially had no interest in having Bush as his running mate. Even then, presidential candidate Ronald Reagan had questions. I would suggest that maybe Mr. Bush would clear the air if he did, if he'd tell us why he resigned. Reagan's backers then forced him to choose their intelligence frontman, George H.W. Bush, as his vice president. But in spite of last year's campaign rhetoric, all seems to be back to normal between George Bush and his old colleagues. And President Reagan, who is relying on many of these powerful business leaders to make his economic package work, will host commission representatives at the White House Monday. After Reagan's election, there was an attempt on his life, just 69 days into office. Astoundingly, Bush would again be connected. So just who is John Hinckley Jr.? When he left this neighborhood eight years ago, he was, by all accounts, well-liked and seemingly normal. This donut shop near the motel was visited by Hinckley, who reportedly waited for a phone call here each day, even though he had a phone in his motel room. The nature of the calls is not known. A touch of irony. The young man walking with the elder Hinckley is 30-year-old Scott Hinckley, John Jr.'s brother. He and Vice President Bush's son, Neil, are friends. They had planned to have dinner together in Denver tonight. The plans have been canceled. We were told Hinckley was a madman acting alone. If that was the case, why was he making phone calls from a payphone down the road instead of his hotel room? Why was the would-be assassin's brother a family friend of the man who stood to gain the presidency? While Reagan led the nation in the public eye, Bush exploited his power through the largely unknown continuity of government directive. United States federal government. There is a super secret agency which controls this shadow government. The National Program Office allowed Bush and his network to attain executive emergency powers. Ronald Reagan authorized the National Program Office when he signed a top secret directive in 1982. Uh, uh, Oliver North was one of the key officers responsible for the program's startup. Under the NPO's direction, Four agencies were charged with execution of the Doomsday Plan. The CIA, the Departments of State and Defense, and the Federal Emergency Management Agency. An effort was being made to consolidate 
continuity of government programs across several major departments of the government under one office. After eight years of secret wars, covertly sponsored revolution and assassination had advanced globalist interests and allowed Bush to achieve his lifelong dream by becoming the 43rd president of the United States. The fall of the Soviet Union left the United States as the sole superpower in the world. The Wolfowitz Doctrine stated, We must maintain the mechanism for deterring potential competitors from even aspiring to a larger regional or global role. The New World Order was on display with the first Gulf War and the creation of a European Union. After losing to his crony Bill Clinton, he faded into the background as the agenda for a New World Order marched forward. After 1989, President Bush kept said, and it's a phrase that I often use myself, that we needed a New World Order. We have just exposed many of the globalist operations, including drug dealing, funding terror, dealing arms, and taking over the United States government by stealth. Whenever these agendas were threatened, those who opposed them ended up dead. We've got some difficult days ahead. But it really doesn't matter with me now. Because I've been to the mountaintop. My thanks to all of you, and now it's on to Chicago, and let's win there. Thank you very much. I gave a paper about all three of the big assassinations in the 60s, which was John F. Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, and Martin Luther King. And there are certain common denominators. I call these events deep events. We've become accustomed to the idea that every now and then something is going to happen and we just know from the beginning we're not going to get to the bottom of it. And the more they happen, the more uh, reconciled we've become to this state of affairs. In 1978, the House Select Committee on Assassinations could not ignore there was a conspiracy in regards to the assassination of John F. Kennedy and Martin Luther King Jr. Good evening. A congressional committee has concluded that President John Kennedy and civil rights leader Martin Luther King Jr., both of them, were probably killed as the result of conspiracies. The House Assassinations Committee wound up its two-year study by recommending that the Justice Department look into both cases. In the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, the committee concluded the likelihood of conspiracy. The committee's summary of findings says President Kennedy was probably assassinated as a result of a conspiracy, that its evidence establishes a high probability that two gunmen fired at the motorcade. The committee concluded that President Kennedy did not receive adequate Secret Service protection in Dallas, that the CIA was deficient in sharing information before and after, that the Justice Department and Warren Commission failed to pursue possible conspiracies and made their conclusions too definite. There seems to be no debate that the CIA and Secret Service were involved in the assassination, as you can clearly see two Secret Service agents being taken away from their positions at the back of Kennedy's vehicle just moments before the assassination. And no matter what you believe about Oswald, it has now been declassified that Oswald was trained by the CIA in 1957 under the cover of the Office of Naval Intelligence. These political assassinations continue to this day. The 11-person jury in the inquest must decide if these stills, never before seen of Diana and the Mercedes and then the crash, are the frantic moments after a tragic accident or the aftermath of a calculated murder. Mohammed Al Fayed, Dodi's father, has long since made up his mind. I believe that my son and Prince Diana have been murdered by the royal family. He claims Diana was pregnant and about to announce her engagement to his son, an embarrassment so great, he says, that Prince Philip commissioned British Secret Service to kill the couple. Assassination is an option when the ruling class can identify an enemy who cannot be compromised. But how do they bend the population's will to do their bidding? Well, the false flag operation is one in which the attacker carries the flag of someone else. It's usually a military operation, and the purpose, of course, is to create the uh, uh, impression that the attacker is someone else. They want to create negative public opinion against the nation whose flag was being used. Um, or they may even 
not use a flag at all. This sort of thing is done all the time, and uh, it's certainly not unique in history. I think we've been seeing a lot of it lately. Americans are easily motivated by false flag operations, and uh, I think it's inevitable that we will see false flag operations in the near future. It is used in order to seize power at an accelerated pace. A very well-documented modern example of this is the Tonkin Gulf incident. There were two sets of uh, Tonkin Gulf incidents. The first one on August 2nd were real but trivial. The second on August 4th, two days later, were the ones to which we actually sent planes off in retaliation and were, in theory, much bigger, a torpedo attack on a U.S. destroyer. But in fact, it never happened. When McNamara visited Vietnam, he confirmed the Tonkin Gulf incident never occurred. And once again, we were lied into war. To this day, I don't know what happened on August 2nd and August 4th, 1964, in the Tonkin Gulf. The general provided the answer, saying his Navy attacked the Maddox on August 2nd. But on the 4th, nothing happened. There was absolutely nothing, he said. We know for a fact now that NSA and CIA both falsified their reports up to Johnson on that day to make it look as if there had been an attack. Upon the fall of communism, a new threat had to be established in order to maintain their military-industrial complex and keep the people in fear of invisible enemies. More modern examples of this have been used not only to start conflicts abroad, but to instill fear in large populations in order to demonize groups and further erode civil liberties. The majority of people still believe that Timothy McVeigh was a right-wing extremist who bombed the Oklahoma City building with a rider truck because he was upset with the government. People close to the event told a very different story. A local congressman believes that convicted bomber Timothy McVeigh and his accused co-conspirator Terry Nichols are not the only ones involved. The Oklahoma State Representative Charles Key produced a videotape featuring witnesses who claimed to have seen Timothy McVeigh with another man the morning of the bombing. He was wearing a ball cap. Timothy McVeigh had his on backwards, which just like this. It was on his head. The other gentleman had his on like this. In fact, the FBI had actively pursued John Doe No. 2 in its initial investigation, then denied his existence altogether. There were also multiple reports that explosives were found inside the Murrah building. The Justice Department is reporting that a second explosive device has been found in the AP Murrah uh, building in downtown Oklahoma City. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike, you're still with us, aren't you? Yes, I am. And I, and I might tell you, in addition to that, that in fact, what we were told at the scene a few minutes ago was that, in fact, two different explosive devices were found in addition to the one that went off. The second explosive was found and diffused. The third explosive that was found, and they are working on right now as we speak, I understand, both the second and third explosives, if you can imagine this, were larger than the first. Bomb squads were actually caught on video, pulling into the building to retrieve these devices. They'll back that trailer down there, and the uh, bomb squad folks will go in, and they will use that, uh, that trailer. You see the, the bucket on the back there, sort of, this is how they would transport the explosive device away from this populated area to try to do something with it. I just took a look down the street uh, at the Mara building again. I see another bomb truck going, so apparently they're gonna try to get out that third bomb that's been talked about. This was even confirmed by the governor at the time, Frank Keating. One device was, uh, was uh, deactivated. Apparently there's another device, and obviously whatever did the damage to the Murrah building was a tremendous, uh, very sophisticated explosive device. Members of the ATF who would have normally been in the building were tipped off prior to the bombing. He saw what appeared to be a police bomb squad truck near the Murrah building two hours before the blast. It had a shield on the side of the door, and it said bomb disposal or bomb squad, blow it, and I really found that interesting. Another witness who spoke to ABC News on the condition of anonymity will tell the grand jury tomorrow he was told by an ATF official agents working in the building had been warned in advance not to come to work. He just came out and told me that the ATF wasn't in the building that day. They'd been tipped by their pagers not to come to work, uh, which I was, flabber I was flabbergasted. McVeigh would even claim in a letter written to his sister 
which was published by the New York Times, that he was actually recruited for black operations, which included smuggling drugs into the United States, as well as assassinations. One may brush this off as the ravings of a madman. However, McVeigh was filmed at the Camp Grafton Military Facility in North Dakota on August 3, 1993. McVeigh's official records state that he was discharged over a year prior from the Army Reserve in May of 1992. Perhaps even more interesting is that Camp Grafton was specializing in training troops in explosives and demolitions at the time. When all was said and done, the security tapes reported to have captured the entire thing on video were rounded up and classified. In 2009, they were finally released, and magically none of them caught the bombing. The excuse being they were all having their tapes changed at that exact moment. This event would be labeled domestic extremism, which was used to demonize critics of world government, militias, and create fear within the populace. Muslim extremism seemed to show its ugly face in then unprecedented fashion on February 26, 1993. A truck bomb had gone off in the parking area of the World Trade Center. Luckily, the bombers failed to follow instructions and parked the truck carrying the explosives against the main support column. What is not discussed, however, is the bomb was actually built by an FBI informant under the supervision of the FBI. Ahmed Salam, a former Egyptian army officer who had been doing undercover work for the FBI, was the man who actually built the bomb. When he was told that he would have to use real bomb-making material instead of harmless substitutes, he became suspicious and began taping his conversations with FBI officials. Last winter, the FBI was praised for its speed in cracking the case of the World Trade Center bombing and bringing four suspects to trial. Now, there is some evidence that the FBI may have known of the plot in advance through an informant and might, might even have stopped the bombing that killed six people. Notice the media emphasizes that they might have been able to stop it. They then gloss over the fact that the bomb was built by their agent under FBI supervision in conjunction with the district attorney. FBI agents might have been able to prevent last February's deadly explosion at New York's World Trade Center. They discussed secretly substituting harmless powder for the explosives, but they didn't, according to the FBI's own informant, Imad Salem. Unbeknownst to the FBI at the time, Salem recorded many of his conversations with his handlers. The actual recording where Salam discusses this with his FBI handler, John Antisev, was released years after the trial. You got paid regularly for, for good information. I mean, the expenses were a little bit out of the ordinary, and it was really questioned. Don't tell Nancy I told you this. But well, well, I have to tell her, of course. Well, then if you have to, you have to. Yeah, because, I mean, the lady was being honest, and I was being honest, and everything was submitted with a receipt. Yeah. Right. And now it's questionable. It's not questionable. It's like a, a little out of ordinary. Okay. You know, the, all right. I don't think it was. If that's what you think, guys, fine. But I don't think that because we was start already building the bomb, which is went off in the World Trade Center. It was built by uh, 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 supervising uh, supervision from the bureau and the GA, and we was all informed about it. And we know that the bomb start to be built by who? By your confidential informant. What a wonderful, great case. Following the convictions of the Muslims who were too inept to make their own bomb and park the vehicle in the proper area, Salam was pulled into the FBI's witness protection program, where he has never been heard from again. Prior to the largest and most devastating terrorist attack on U.S. soil, the United States was poised as the first truly global superpower. Brzezinski would muse in 1997 that geostrategic success would represent a fitting legacy of America's role as the first, only, and last truly global superpower and that the only way to mobilize Americans was a truly massive and widely perceived direct external threat. In September of 2000, a neoconservative think tank called the Project for a New American Century echoed Brzezinski's statements, saying the United States is the world's only superpower, combining preeminent military power, global technological leadership, and the world's largest economy. An engine for New World Order ideals, members of PNAC included Dick Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld, Jeb Bush, Scooter Libby, William Crystal, and Paul Wolfowitz. Describing the difficulty in projecting force, they write the process of transformation is likely to be a long one, absent some catastrophic and catalyzing event, like a new Pearl Harbor. This takes us full circle to the September 11th attacks of 2001. 
In my previous film, Fabled Enemies, I expose in great detail the Saudi Arabian, Pakistani, and Israeli connections in conjunction with this international intelligence operation. In the early 1980s, bin Laden worked with operatives from U.S. intelligence, the Pakistani military, and Arab states. They ran a wide-ranging covert network that recruited and financed Muslim fighters to battle the Soviet army. The hijackers that were trained at U.S. military installations and protected by the FBI and CIA. The military exercises leading up to 9-11 and those that took place as the attacks occurred. Open line. Command, Sergeant Richmond. Sergeant Richmond, Sergeant Richmond, Sergeant Richmond, Cheyenne Mountain Test Control, how are you? I'm doing fine. Okay, I need you to terminate all exercise inputs coming to Cheyenne Mountain at this time. Copy. And uh, stay on loop until I verify that you just were connectivity is disconnected on the exercise side only. Okay, no, do not do any more inputs on the exercise side and stand by. I got Cheyenne Mountain on the line. Terminating all exercise inputs. So, Rover, if you didn't know there's uh, exercise. Oh, yes. The Black Ops Program able danger and the shadow government involvement this morning we learned that the vice president wasn't the only one sent to an undisclosed location on september 11th that an entire backup government was and is still there and may be there for as long as anyone now at least can imagine as well as much much more the government has lied about 9-11 repeatedly and used it to dominate the middle east while creating an evolving police state here encroaching on civil liberties at home and of course, building a new world order. There is a chance for the President of the United States to use this disaster to carry out what his father, a phrase his father used, I think only once, and hasn't been used since, and that is a new world order. We know now that September 11th of 2001 was the beginning of what we might call a new world order. The new world order that uh, uh, this president's uh, father talked about with such great enthusiasm seems to be high on the agenda of this administration. Under the second Bush administration, massive amounts of civil liberties were openly and brazenly taken away following 9-11. The passage of the Patriot Acts, the Military Commissions Act, and other horrifying anti-constitutional legislation was enabled by the incredible amount of fear generated by the media, all in the name of keeping us safe here at home. The war itself would create huge profits for the military-industrial complex, and the globalists would seize even more power and control over Middle Eastern resources in what they planned to become a Eurasian Union under their control. Although the establishment claimed to be fighting for our freedom abroad, they were destroying our sovereignty by stealth. Expanding on NAFTA, they were able to consolidate power on the domestic front by deindustrializing the United States through CAFTA, the Central American Free Trade Agreement, as well as the SPP, the Securities and Prosperity Partnership. Opponents, however, say the initiative is nothing less than a plan to create a North American Union that would eliminate sovereignty for all three nations. Building on the North American Free Trade Agreement, the NAFTA section of the Commerce Department is busy drafting laws and regulations for a North American Union, a union of Canada, America, and Mexico. The President has attended secret meetings and signed at least two agreements under the Security and Prosperity Partnership Program. The stated goal established by Presidents Bush, Fox, and Prime Minister Paul Martin is integration by 2010. That's a plan from the business elites, the political elites, that will cost more American jobs, cost American sovereignty, but it would fulfill the President's father's vision. Now former United States Trade Ambassador Robert Zolick is talking about it again with renewed vigor. This time a new world order with business at the helm of trade and economic policy. It's an agenda that goes hand in hand with the United States, Mexico and Canada working quietly and behind the scenes to promote a common market with common deregulation for the benefit of multinational corporations. It's remarkable to me the arrogance, the, the idea of just simply throwing away the nation's sovereignty, but they're trying to do so in so many ways. People better understand that they mean exactly what they're saying. It's a new world order they're trying to create. Dobbs, the only mainstream anchor to expose the new world order, resigned shortly after bullets were fired into his home. The elite do not plan on waiting around for these unions to be formed before implementing the next step in global government. Through the vast global economic crisis of the last few years, they have been able to devalue the dollar and undermine it as the world's reserve currency. 
They have allowed the Federal Reserve and IMF to consolidate power by taking control of the Securities and Exchange Commission, as well as issuing a global currency instead of the dollar, disguised as a special drawing rights unit. This aspect of the New World Order was announced at the G20 in April of 2009. There is a big thing that's going to happen in London at this G20, and then they're hiding it, they're camouflaging it, they're not talking about it. Coordination of international regulation. Mm -hmm. What they are going to do is to put our Fed and our SEC under the control, in effect, of the IMF. The New World Order, that's what they're, they're planning in there, is, is to um, undermine the U.S. currency, and it's just... It's just really sad. What it really is, is putting the American economy under international regulation. Yeah. And those people who have been yelling, oh, the UN's going to take over global conspiracy government. Conspiracy theorists. They conspir they've been crazy, but now they they're right. There's 20 or whatever people in the G20, say there's 20 ministers, thousands of us, and we can't get our voices heard. When Ga Geithner said he would be open to the idea of a global currency last exactly. week, yeah. th those conspiracy people had said and suggested that for That's years. Right. You're not wrong. Cash is becoming weeded out. Uh, cash will most likely be eliminated or, or extremely difficult to use in many situations so that you'll have to use the global currency or the electronic currency. Even though a physical global currency is yet to exist, groups such as BRIC are openly promoting a new reserve currency, which is a conglomerate of Brazil, Russia, Indonesia, and China get everyone in the whole world using one currency, uh, which some people think that's a good idea. Russian President Dmitry Medvedev recently showed off a sample coin of the new world currency at the G8 in July of 2009. We have also agreed today additional resources of one trillion dollars that are available to the world economy through the International Monetary Fund and other institutions. This includes 250 billions from special drawing rights, the reserve currency of the IMF, drawing rights that will be issued to countries who are part of the International Monetary Fund. I think a new world order is emerging and with it the foundations of a new and progressive era of international cooperation. The head of the European Union is also calling for global government. 2009 is also the first year of global governance with the establishment of the G20 in the middle of the financial crisis. Gordon Brown has called for a world constitution. We now need nothing short of a world constitution for the global financial system. Both Gordon Brown and Barack Obama had been groomed to be the next Anglo-American spokesman for this new world order after Bush and Blair stepped down. Here is Gordon Brown in front of the CBI prior to him being chosen to become prime minister. And it's only now that we can begin to understand that the world order that globalization brings and what it's going to look like. But what does the new world order mean for countries like ours who are looking to succeed? And the question for us is how we meet and master all these challenges to ensure that Britain enhances its competitiveness in the process and realize, realizes what I believe is our destiny of success in this new world order. A new world is emerging. It is a new world order with significantly different and radically new challenges for the future. President Barack Obama has also espoused similar views on globalism. Here he is in Berlin, Germany in July of 2008 in what media have dubbed his new world order speech. Well, there have been extraordinary scenes in Berlin tonight as thousands of people gathered to hear Barack Obama deliver key foreign policy speech on his current European tour. The Democratic presidential hopeful laid out his vision for America's place in a new world order. In this new world, such dangerous currents have swept along faster than our efforts to contain them. And that is why we cannot afford to be divided. No one nation no matter how large or powerful, can defeat such challenges alone. But the burdens of global citizenship continue to bind us together. In this new century, Americans and Europeans alike will be required to do more, not less. Partnership and cooperation among nations is not a choice. It is the only way, the one way, to protect our common security and advance our common humanity. That is why 
America cannot turn inward. That is why Europe cannot turn inward. America has no better partner than Europe. Now, now is the time to build new bridges across the globe as strong as the one that binds us across the Atlantic. Now is the time to join together through constant cooperation and strong institutions and shared sacrifice and a global commitment to progress to meet the challenges of the 21st century. Barack Obama also became the first sitting president to ever become the chair of the Security Council for the United Nations, which only further cites his allegiance to world government. In an era when our destiny is shared, power is no longer a zero-sum game. No one nation can or should try to dominate another nation. No world order that elevates one nation or group of people over another will succeed. No balance of power among nations will hold. The traditional divisions between nations of the South and the North make no sense in an interconnected world. I think its task will be to develop an overall strategy for America in this period when really a new world order can be created. It's a great opportunity. The globalists, who know that Obama is going to promote their uh, plan, want to make him uh, such a superhero that nobody will question what he's doing. He is very much a product of the system that he is now technically in charge of. Obama alone, or the Democrat Party alone, is not responsible for his massive rock star uh, status. It's been done by the media. This establishes that Obama is an unapologetic globalist who holds no one nation above another, despite its policies. Perhaps we should move towards a society more like China, if that's the case. After all, on the 60th anniversary of the communist Mao regime takeover, the Empire State Building, once a proud symbol of the United States, was lit in the colors of the Communist Party halfway across the world. In fact, following the United Nations Copenhagen Conference in December of 2009, the Washington Post ran the headline, Copenhagen Climate Deal Shows New World Order May Be Led by U.S., China. The Copenhagen Conference was disguised as a summit that would save the planet from man-made global warming by cutting carbon emissions. When taking a look at the almost 200-page document that was being proposed, it becomes evident that this was yet another attempt to establish global government and set up a global tax. In Section 38, it states, The scheme for the new institutional arrangement under the Convention will be based on three basic pillars, government, facilitative mechanism, and financial mechanism. In Section 47, subsection F, it discusses cap-and-trade schemes and carbon taxes and the use of new and existing flexible carbon market mechanisms. These cap-and-trade schemes were just that, a scheme to further transfer the wealth from the poor to the ultra-rich. One of the ways it will drive the change is through global governance and global agreements. The fact that our president even attended should be considered treason. Just weeks before the conference, ClimateGate hit the media. Secret emails confirm that many of the United Nations' lead scientists had engaged in fraud in order to promote the idea that man-made global warming was occurring and that carbon dioxide was a toxic gas. In reality, they admitted the Earth had been cooling for the last decade and that they had destroyed the source data in order to ensure the scientific community would be unable to review their findings. Bill Jones was forced to resign from his position at East Anglia University, and Penn State has launched an investigation into Michael Mann. Because of the scandal, many countries refused to sign the agreement, and instead only 25 heads of state, including rock star president and savior Barack Obama, signed a much shorter and broader accord. The document states that a high-level panel will be created, and that parties will be subject to domestic auditing, supervision, and assessment. The Climate Conference in Copenhagen is another step towards the global management of our planet. The idea that carbon dioxide, the life force for plants here on Earth, is a toxic gas and should be taxed is laughable. There have been numerous periods of time in which the Earth has had vastly more carbon in the atmosphere than present day. In areas where there have been volcanic eruptions which emit large amounts of CO2, plants have benefited and there is no negative impact on the surrounding environment, as well as indigenous people from the excess carbon dioxide. The globalists promote this theory to keep mankind in fear, not only for the establishment of a global government and a global carbon tax, but the literal control of the entire planet.
An even darker side to the scam of man-made global warming exists. In reality, it's about population control. Ted Turner reveals himself here in this interview with Charlie Rose. We've got to stabilize the population. When I was born, no, there were so too, what's wrong with the population? I mean, were too many people. That's what. That's why we have global warming. We have global warming because too many people are using too much stuff. We've got to stabilize population on a voluntary basis. Everybody in the world's got to pledge to themselves that one or two children is it. Not doing it will be catastrophic. We'll have eight degrees. We'll be eight degrees hotter in 10, not 10, but in 30 or 40 years. And basically none of the crops will grow. Most of the people will have died and the rest of us will be cannibals. Civilization will have broken down. What the few people are left will be living in a failed state like Somalia or Sudan. And, and living conditions will be intolerable. The droughts will be so bad there'll be no more corn growing. It, it will, it, not doing it is suicide. Unbelievably, when Turner met with other globalists, David Rockefeller, Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, Michael Bloomberg, and even Oprah Winfrey to discuss population control, they were portrayed as superheroes. Behind closed doors on this New York campus, a secret gathering of some of the world's most powerful people. Gates, Buffett, Bloomberg, Winfrey. It was like, well, it was like the Super Friends. In the great hall of the Justice League, there are assembled the world's four greatest heroes. Together with others at the meeting, including George Soros, Ted Turner, David Rockefeller, they're worth more than $125 billion. The new Superman and Wonder Woman, the super rich friends, not fighting bad guys, but fighting for good nonetheless. Would a superhero call for a one-child policy? Would a superhero call for population control? In a recent interview, he claims that 2 billion people would be ideal. That means 4 billion plus must die to accommodate a man who owns more acreage than anyone else on the planet. Let's not forget that Ted Turner is the president of the United Nations Foundation. There are countless examples of how we are being indoctrinated to accept these kind of conditions and believe that man and his activities are the problem. From the promotion of climate cops. We're the carbon cops and we're on the lookout for energy wasters. The phony liberals and conservatives getting together to promote climate change. Now, let's face it, we're polar opposites. We couldn't be further apart. I'm on the left. And I'm usually right. And we strongly disagree. Except on one issue. Tell them what it is, Reverend Pat. That would be our planet. Taking care of it is extremely important. We all need to work together, liberals and conservatives. So get involved. It's the right thing to do. Now, there you go again. The New World Order will stop at nothing to achieve planetary dominance, whether it be assassination, wars based on lies, and even a phony environmental movement. So it should come as no surprise that they have been tracking, tracing, and databasing our lives for years. Many people are aware that the Bush administration engaged in warrantless wiretaps on American citizens. What they don't understand is that it has come out in court that all the major telecommunications companies have been secretly storing every piece of data received from our phones and our computers and handing them over to the National Security Agency. You heard about the government secretly listening in on phone conversations without a warrant, but there is evidence that your email is also being tapped. The government has been intercepting most emails as part of its terrorist surveillance program. That program has been criticized as illegal because it's missing an important ingredient, search warrants. Several years ago, Klein says he came to suspect that AT&T had installed secret computer gear designed to spy on internet traffic at the request of the National Security Agency. This is just a small part of the picture, as AT&T was not the only company involved and emails were not the only issue. The NSA was installing Norris Insight Systems, which are capable of monitoring billions of bits of internet traffic per second. It was also able to monitor any calls traffic through its system, all websites visited, all instant messaging, and separate types of transaction records. The secret room at AT&T contains gear which enables the government to look at every individual message on the internet and analyze exactly what people are doing. Here's another document. It mentions a company called Naris. Naris makes computer software that can swallow and analyze 10 gigabytes of information every second. That means it could go through all the information in all the books in the Library of Congress in a little over 15 minutes. 
The documents Klein and others were able to produce were then censored by the NSA. Bankston isn't allowed to talk about the documents in detail. The government has since had them sealed. But he says what is in there boggles the mind. We are talking about a substantial portion of all the communications traffic in the United States. The policies have been shielded by the Obama administration and continue to this day. Attorney General Holder has publicly stated lawsuits be thrown out of court. And after several attempts, Klein and other cases were thrown out as well. Once again, citing the national security of what used to be a constitutional republic, not a massive corrupt slave state. Living in the New World Order, when it's close to completion for the average citizen, for people like you and me, is going to be essentially slavery. We're never going to be able to get ahead. We're never going to be able to amass enough wealth uh, essentially to retire or to, to do what we want to do in life. We're going to constantly be working for the man. They're creating essentially a two-class system. So it's going to be an inner ruling elite and then everyone else. And i got news for you. You're everyone else. The new world order that is currently being built revolves around creating a global technopoly ruled by the elite, in which they dominate and control a severely reduced populace, which they treat as their pets. In the new world order, the people are the enemy. Internal documents released in March of 2009 reveal that the Department of Homeland Security is targeting citizens who discussed the New World Order, people with a Christian identity or sovereign citizens who argue that the government has gotten away from the intent of the Constitution and are strong states' rights advocates. People who are anti-immigration, stating, extremists will argue that immigrants are taking the jobs of U.S. citizens during times of high unemployment and without paying taxes. People who oppose the Federal Reserve banking system People who display constitutional party or libertarian material. People who support Ron Paul. And those who have bumper stickers containing anti-government rhetoric. This document is one of literally thousands that make everyone a possible terrorist. This establishes a pattern of demonizing ordinary citizens while giving draconian powers to the state. You are considered guilty until proven innocent. As technology is developed, separate parts of their command and control system are beta tested around the world. Here at home, Boy Scouts are being trained to take on returning veterans and disarm domestic extremists, while national programs such as City Year are training young people to serve the government. I am change. I am fierce. In the United Kingdom, it has been established there are over 4 million CCTV cameras. That is around one camera for every 14 citizens. Their purpose is not to solve crime, as it takes 1,000 CCTV cameras to solve just one crime. It is to create a tattletale society in which everyone is under constant surveillance by the state and those around them. The company Internet Eyes is now paying people to log on to the Internet and watch CCTV cameras in real time as they turn in criminals for cash. Families deemed by the state to be unfit in England have now been put under 24-hour CCTV supervision in their homes. This program has plans for 20,000 families in England, which is to double in the next two years. Your every move in both your home and the outside world is under constant surveillance by a criminal elite who operate above the law. As we are constantly under the microscope, their activities remain in the shadows. Obama extended diplomatic immunity to Interpol with Executive Order 12,425, further empowering criminal behavior within our own government. In the Middle East, endless wars will continue. Under the Obama administration, we have sent tens of thousands of more troops into Afghanistan. All while the same network exposed in the Iran-Contra affair discussed earlier controls the opium trade. It was revealed in October of 2009 that the CIA had been funding puppet Afghani leader Hamid Karzai's warlord brother for the last eight years. He is the lead opium dealer in the region. It seems the same cartel that was dealing drugs in the 80s and 90s never stopped. After all, how else could the government fund black operation programs across the board? The Karzai regime has whole sections of it which are drug supported and uh, we can't touch it. We turned Afghanistan into the major supplier of heroin for the world. It happened under CIA supervision. This continues while many of the Taliban are literally on U.S. payrolls. Is there a possibility that we have Taliban employees? Uh, The commander in the field, or the, I should say the uh, COCOM commander, General Petraeus, has made it a conscious effort to, uh, as part of his coin strategy, to hire local nationals. Uh, I can't talk in this 
in this form, nor am I the qualified guy to talk about it. But uh, there is no doubt in my mind, one day you're on one side of the ledger, the other day you may be on the other side of the ledger. Biometrics have been instituted in both Afghanistan and Iraq, where individuals are subject to fingerprint devices, iris scanners, and electronic databases to screen local residents as well as DNA tests. This includes anyone within the populace of a combat zone. Someone has to go out there with the biometric registration equipment, take your iris scans, take your, take your scans and get you registered in the system like that. As scary and tyrannical as these systems seem to be, none may be as dangerous as the implantable RFID microchip. Through various pretenses, including terror, security, and entertainment, the chip has been promoted and integrated into society. In 2001, following the 9-11 terrorist attacks, the Jacobs family became the first family to be injected with microchips in front of a live television audience. We have a Florida family who are really pioneers in a brave new world. They have volunteered to be the first ever to have microchip identification devices implanted into their body. After 9-11, I was really concerned um, with the security of my family. In 2004, the FDA approved the use of RFID technology to be implanted into human beings. However, studies dating back to the 1990s show the implantable microchip has been linked to cancer in animals. But this has not slowed the agenda of control. In Barcelona, trendies get chips in order to receive VIP status at the exclusive Baja nightclub. A simple swipe of the arm get them in without a line, and it pays for their drinks, too. The Mexican government also chipped employees for security measures in 2004. We were interested today to hear that more than 100 law enforcement officials in Mexico are having microchips implanted in their arms. The chips allow a person to be scanned, sort of like a cereal box at the supermarket checkout. Mexico's attorney general and 160 of his deputies have had microchips implanted in their arms. It is to provide access, said the attorney general, to the right people in exclusive areas. Today, aside from being promoted as a device that can save your life by storing all of your medical information in it, it is being promoted as the next generation tool for video gaming. Sega developer Yu Suzuki plans on developing gaming technology using implantable RFIDs. He states, people that have some sort of chips in their bodies to be able to keep track of vital signs. So it doesn't have to be a scary thing, but you could put a sensor here, you know, a bit like the matrix, as he points to his arm. It's not really something only in the future. Some people already have them, chips in their bodies. Suzuki is correct. It has never been easier to order a microchip online and implant it under your skin. Microchips implanted in your hand, arm, or shoulder is just the beginning. Some have already taken implantable brain chips that may enable the blind to see again, the deaf to hear, and much, much more, including the ability to download information directly into the brain and instantly communicate with anyone in the world, creating a worldwide mind. It's very interesting that the way that the New World Order is going uh, is moving towards a system that is identical to that, whether it's going to be an implantable microchip, an RFID, uh, a thumb scan, whether it's going to be some sort of a, a tattoo. Imagine a planet where every human being is required to be chipped at birth. This would be the final tool implemented in a command and control world government system in which the elite rule the masses with total control of their lives. This is, of course, a terrible uh, predicament for those of us who are convinced that this system is slowly but surely destroying this country and has to be changed, but we can't count on the elected presidents to do it and we can't count on the elected Congress to do it. We somehow have to mobilize the technological resources of the Internet to create some kind of new political force in this country. So is there anything else about the ruling class we should know? Politicians, business leaders, and media figures are often portrayed as pillars of morality while they describe themselves as Christian conservatives. Nothing could be further from the truth. In reality, many of the elite are groomed at a young age to take part in occult rituals. Those who attend Yale are indoctrinated into the Order of Skull and Bones, an elite secret society cloaked as a fraternal order. Yale University is 300 years old this year, and were you to visit its campus, you would see that it still has exotic clubhouses which look like tombs where Yale's legendary secret societies meet. Their prestige and importance have largely evaporated, but the rituals are still a secret. 
And so when we heard that some enterprising characters had managed to spy on the famous Skull and Bones Society, well, we couldn't resist. Skull and Bones, people say it's a fraternity at Yale University, but it's really a postgraduate organization. So it was founded in 1832. And it's not like a normal fraternity. People don't pledge. These people choose who they want to come. So they do the recruiting. They recruit 15 people every year. People who they see are going to be powerful people in the future. So they're recruited when they're a junior in college. A lot of these people come from really wealthy and influential families because they know that this person has the resources to then elevate them to a position of power that can benefit the club. The video shows the neophytes, or initiates, kissing a skull, then performing a mock human sacrifice. Horrific screams caught on tape include chants of, the devil equals death, death equals the devil. True. Famous alums include senators, John Kerry and John Chafee, to name two, cabinet secretaries, such as Averill Harriman, and three presidents, William Taft, George Bush, and George W. Bush, who's been reluctant to talk about Skull and Bones. Does it still exist? Um, the thing is so secret that I'm not even sure it still exists. Former Skull and Bones members and current members have been presidents, uh, heads of the CIA, senators, heads of business. I mean, huge, huge corporations. These people have the network that brings them to such a position of power that most people could only dream of. Bush would run against his fellow Bonesman and distant cousin John Kerry in 2004. You both were members of Skull and Bones, a secret society at Yale. What does that tell us? Uh, not much, because it's a secret. <laughs> Is there a secret handshake? Is there a secret code? I wish there were something secret I could manifest. 322, a secret number? Uh, there are all kinds of secrets, Tim. You were both in Skull and Bones, the secret society. It's so secret we can't talk about it. What does that mean for America? The conspiracy theorists are going to go wild. I'm sure they are. I don't know. I haven't seen the web. Number 322. <laughs> <laughs> this is an elaborate, occult, ritualistic entry into this group that they are now a member of for life. This culture of death in the occult continues long after college. Later on in life, these pagan rituals carry on in the redwoods of Sonoma, California. And what is the Bohemian Grove? Well, it's a kind of summer camp for the powerful an all-male gathering in great secrecy. This group was formed in the late 1800s by artists, industrialists, and politicians. Bohemian attendees worshiped the owl as their deity. The Aztecs, Mayans, and other natives of Mesoamerica considered the owl a symbol of destruction and death. This is why the opening ritual for the club is the cremation of care. During the ritual, the effigy of a baby is rowed across the water by the Grim Reaper and given to a high priest who then tosses it on a fiery sacrificial altar of a 40-foot owl god. It is an earth-based ritual in which care is burned away. The conscience is symbolically cast aside so that they may ignore the pain they have inflicted on others for the advancement of their own agendas. With this ceremony called the cremation of care that uh, begins the, uh, the uh, two-week encampment where the body of dull care symbolizing woes and concerns is burned on an altar in front of a big owl statue, when that ceremony ends, they all start to cheer and yell. You have to ask yourself why. Why it is that somebody would want to do that, let alone these elite people. And if you look at the elite throughout history, many of the people that achieve pinnacles of power are into the occult. They seek a supernatural way to gain power. Why are Christian conservatives such as the Bushes and Newt Gingrich attending the Grove? And I, I recognize I'm not going to be invited to Renaissance Weekend or that Bohemian deal where Newt, Rush, and Dick all sit in a teepee, naked, beating on tom-toms. Why does the media barely mention the Grove? Because many of them are in attendance. Late political cartoonist Phil Frank of the San Francisco Chronicle draws a reporter thinking about his loyalties to Bohemian Grove as he takes notes for a story. Stories about what happens in these redwoods are hard to come by. A campground statue reminds Bohemians to keep their mouths shut about the Grove. Many world events have been shaped at the Grove, including the creation of the atomic bomb. Discussions at the Grove in the 1930s helped lead to the development of nuclear power and the atomic bomb. 
Every Republican president since Calvin Coolidge has been a member, as well as many Democrats, including Jimmy Carter. If you look at the membership lists of the Bohemian Grove and the Council on Foreign Relations, the Bilderberg Group, a lot of the key level people are overlapping and are involved in, in numerous groups. In addition to pagan rituals that take place there, this all-male club also deals with darker themes. Through the plays Montezuma, which feature Aztec human sacrifice, and Faust, which feature Mephisto. Some of these plays are disturbingly flamboyant. Many of the elitists have a penchant for cross-dressing and singing show tunes. Perhaps that is why much of the all-male staff also happen to be homosexuals. Well, each year, uh, many of them seem to have a stunt uh, or try to come up with a stunt. Last year, 1980, uh, the popular button was uh, Free the Fortune 500. Bohemian Grove that I attend, one time at a time, it is the most fagged goddamn thing you will ever, ever imagine. In 2004, the New York Post reported that gay porn star Chad Savage would be servicing moguls at the Bohemian Grove. In recent years, several politicians have been outed in scandals, including Senator Larry Craig, who tried to solicit sex from an undercover officer in 2007. Even more shocking, it was revealed in 2004 that right-wing blogger James Guckert, who had unprecedented access to the White House during the Iraq War, was actually Jeff Gannon, a madam and male prostitute for MilitaryStuds.com. During his two years writing for GOP USA and Talon News, Gannon officially made over 200 appearances at the White House. Oddly enough, over two dozen of these visits would take place when there were no scheduled briefings. He failed to check in or out with the Secret Service on many other occasions, coming and going as he pleased. These type of activities are not new to the White House. In 1989, headlines involving call boys in the White House rocked the cover of the Washington Times. The Washington Times reported today that unidentified White House aides in the Carter, Reagan, and Bush administrations now are being investigated for using the services of a call boy ring. The paper reports that two of the male prostitutes were given a late-night tour of the White House last year. Hundreds of credit card receipts obtained by the Washington Times confirmed that its clients were key officials of the Reagan and Bush administrations, military officers, congressional aides, and U.S. and foreign businessmen with close social ties to Washington's political elite. This ring extended beyond the White House and into Congressman Barney Frank's bedroom. Barney Frank, one of two openly homosexual members of Congress, acknowledged having used a male prostitute whom he then hired as a personal employee. The man had keys to Frank's basement apartment on Capitol Hill. Frank paid him approximately $20,000 out of his own pocket to be his housekeeper and driver. But as first reported in today's Washington Times, the man was on probation for sex crimes and a drug conviction. And he ran a prostitution business out of Frank's home. Although Frank tried to claim ignorance, Stephen Gobi, the prostitute in question, claimed that Frank was completely aware of what was going on and was even receiving free and discounted sexual services. The fix seemed to be in. Frank was threatening members of Congress to remain silent prior to being exposed in this sex ring. Massachusetts Democrat Barney Frank, a homosexual, threatened to expose fellow congressmen he knew to be gay unless they stopped spreading rumors. Questions stopped and Frank walked away with a slap on the wrist. Some members of the Ethics Committee were disgusted. Do we tolerate, do we condone a member of this body who knowingly permits a house of prostitution to be operated out of his residence. You have just heard one of the most edited, selective garbage that has ever been put forth, in my opinion, in this house. Again, we see people of the highest levels of power involved in the most repulsive and decadent of crimes. They couldn't care less about the code of conduct that's taught in all major religions about treating others the way that you want to be treated. And then they masquerade, they put this false front on that they're like everybody else because your average person wants to do right, believes in some sort of a karma, believes in some sort of a divine uh, justice in the universe. And so these people need to put on this front that they're like the average Joe in middle America, that they go to church every once in a while, and that they believe in an afterlife and a divine justice. And so they have to put on this front 
that they're like everybody else in order to get elected and to be accepted and to not have people look at them suspiciously because if somebody goes around and openly admits that they were an atheist or that they were of some obscure religion, uh, people aren't going to throw their support behind them as much and they're not going to trust them as easily. The reality of this behavior is never revealed to the public as the media keeps any revelations quiet. Unfortunately, these type of activities continue to this day. Florida Congressman Mark Foley chaired the House Caucus on Missing and Exploited Children and went on television praising Chris Hansen's To Catch a Predator series. The Dateline piece has probably done more than any law we can create. Foley was later caught attempting to have sexual relations with numerous underage pages. Congressman Mark Foley, the man who championed the Child Protection Act of 2006, resigned after inappropriate emails and instant messages surfaced that he sent to former congressional pages. Once more, no charges were even filed. Foley himself has checked into rehab. No one has been charged with any crime. The predator class acts like Roman emperors, indulging in excess that includes sex with young boys while portraying themselves as men of the Lord. The insanity is that we have allowed an interwoven elite criminal class to rule over us while posing as the saviors of the planet. We have learned they will stop at nothing to achieve their goals and are not held accountable for their crimes. They prey on the system rather than protect it. This is not a new world order of peace and prosperity. It is not a world government to save the earth. During difficult times, we must remain ever vigilant against seemingly positive solutions imposed to suit their aims. Crises there will continue to be. In meeting them, whether foreign or domestic, great or small, there is a recurring temptation to feel that some spectacular and costly action could become the miraculous solution to all current difficulties. We are threatened by a superclass that control the flow of information and high technology from the public. The prospect of domination of the nation's scholars by federal employment, project allocations, and the power of money is ever present and is gravely to be regarded. We must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captive of a scientific, technological elite. It is time to put down the remote control, to turn off your Xbox, and start paying attention. It is time to step away from everyday luxuries and pop culture and take action against a monolithic concentrated evil in order to save what's left of humanity. We must now trade in our apathy for action in order to defeat this invisible empire. How set up are we to deal with this new world order? I think we're going to hear a lot about that today. Let's take the new world order. Uh, it's an interesting phrase. Uh, I've been thinking a little bit about the structure of the world, right? The new world order, as everybody says. The peace could yield to the pernicious new world order. The new world order. The new world order. The new world order. The new world order. This new world order. Stay fixed on your goal of imposing the new world order. We kept talking about a new world order. A new world order. That's what we need now. A new world order with swing. One war and one victory doth not a new world order make. Conservatives used to believe in the United States of America rather than the United States of the new world order. The ambition to create a new world order. Whose world order is this? I and mean, of course what he called it was the new world order. Respect for a new world order. We can see a new world coming into the view, etc., etc. That's the core of the new world order that we want to try to build. It's the sole superpower, the new world order. New world order. A new world order. To a new world order of peace. Let's say a new world order, for want of a better term. Entities of the new world order. The whole concept of new world order is something else. It really says that the state is God. The state will play a bigger role in the economy. New order. What Wilson wanted was a new world order not just a new world order. In order to compete in the new world order. Compete in this new world order. This is the third leg of the new world order. We had the World Bank, we had the IMF, and now we had the World Trade Organization. A rigid new world order. This hoped for new world order. Constructing a new world order in the new world order of the 21st century. The new world order we're going to put in place in this new world order. In this new world order. Order. The patriots in this country are not going to see their rights diminished in order to create a new world order. President Bush has described as a new world order, which I share that 
we all share that same desire. A new world order is surely in the making here. Are we ready for the new world order? It's a timely and often controversial question. You don't hear a politician speak the way you do in America. It's about the future of Europe and a new world order. Mr. Mr. President, thank you so much, and I hope to have you again, and I hope to see you again. again.